Today on Uncommon Knowledge, the affirmative action debate goes global. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Affirmative Action Around the World, a conversation with economist Thomas Sowell. Affirmative action programs here in the United States, first instituted to address the historical disadvantages suffered by black Americans, have long been controversial. But what about affirmative action programs in other countries? Has affirmative action proven more or less effective abroad? What common patterns do affirmative action programs share? And what can the study of affirmative action in other countries teach us about affirmative action here at home? Thomas Sowell is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the author, most recently, of Affirmative Action Around the World, an Empirical Study. Thomas Sowell, page one of your latest book, Affirmative Action Around the World, I quote you to yourself. Many, if not most, people who are for or against affirmative action are for or against the theory of affirmative action, the factual question of what actually happens as a result of affirmative action policies receives remarkably little attention. Close quote. Why? Oh, you'd have to ask those people why. I mean, to me, uh, you know, the first question is, well, what actually happens when you do this stuff? But uh, most people seem to be locked into whatever position they're locked into. They think it's wonderful or they think it's terrible on the basis of what they imagine. Let's look at some of the data. India, once again, from affirmative action around the world, quote, India has had affirmative action programs longer than any other nation, beginning in the British colonial times and then provided for in its constitution when it became an independent country in 1947, close quote. Take us through this. In India, affirmative action is for whom? Initially, it was for the untouchables who were probably among the most persecuted people on earth. Uh, at a time when blacks in the South had to sit in the back of the bus, untouchables weren't supposed to sit anywhere. They were to stand in the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and then it just goes on from there. This is what percentage of the population? About, uh, if I remember correctly, about 16%. 16%, and these are people who are so low they don't even count in the caste system. No, they? that's right, right. that's right. Uh, treated, treated abominably. Uh, and so it's understandable people would want to do something to make things better for them. Uh, what actually happened, however, is that extremely few untouchables actually are able to make use of any of these uh, uh, preferences and quotas. The preferences and quotas are for hiring or education or what form well, do they take? They are, they are actually for, the, for hiring, for education, uh, for seats in parliament. Uh, but of course, for all those things, you have to have various complementary resources. So it doesn't do you any good if you're somebody out in a little village where you're struggling to make ends meet, that there's a place reserved for you in the medical school. Uh, you know, and you'll be lucky if you can make it to high school. Is that a case of affirmative action badly aimed? Meaning, should there, should there be more economic resources? Should that be the kind of affirmative action? Should they be targeting uh, uh, Milton Friedman's old idea of a negative income tax? Should they just be putting cash in the hands of untouchables? That wouldn't be affirmative action, I guess. Well, affirmative action really is preferences and quotas. And okay. But the things for which they create preferences and quotas, not only in India but in other countries around the world, are typically things that the elite would be interested in. College admission, government jobs, uh, seats in parliament. And for that, you have to have other, other resources. So what we call untouchables as if they're one sort of uniform group is really a, a, a collection of many different groups, uh, many of whom are separate from each other and do not intermarry or whatnot. Uh, and the ones of, of, of the untouchables, there are some who are, who are prosperous for one historical reason or another. And they grab off the lion's share of all these uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of untouchables uh, are, uh, are completely cut off from these things. Let me quote you again. This is from your conclusion about India. It is hard to escape the conclusion that affirmative action in India has produced minimal benefits to those most in need and maximum resentments and hostility toward them on the part of others. Yes. And that's the second piece of this. Uh, why, sh why should it be that affirmative action should, should increase the resentment toward untouchables? Because uh, if, there, if, there, if there are uh, 100 jobs there 
and three of them have been uh, set aside for untouchables, and three untouchables are actually able to make use of the uh, set-asides for them, then everybody who lost a job will say he would have he would have been hired if it only been uh, the untouchables hadn't grabbed these. Mm. Now, there may, so there may be 50 people seething with anger and not having gotten these three jobs. But had there been no untouchables, uh, 47 of them wouldn't have gotten the jobs anyway. I see. And so you create a, a resentment out of all proportion to the actual benefits that have been transferred. You write that although India has had this policy of affirmative action for many decades, violent incidents toward untouchables never fell below 13,000 a year during the 1980s and actually rose to more than 20,000 a year during the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Question, would you go so far as to argue that the untouchables themselves would have been better off had India never instituted affirmative action programs? It's a tough one, but I, was, I, would, I would lean towards saying yes. On what basis? Uh, On the basis that so few of them have gotten anything at all, and all of them have suffered from the backlash. I see. Our next case study takes us from India to Southeast Asia. Malaysia. One of the more prosperous countries of Southeast Asia, population 23 million. Of those 23 million, about half are Malays, a quarter are Chinese, and about 7% are Indians. Mm -hmm. Care to give us a brief history of the affirmative action programs in Malaysia? The, the Chinese, first of all, were making uh, at least twice the income of the Malays. Uh, so no, what you have there is a minority. A quarter of the population is doing far better than, any, than, the, than the larger number of indigenous yeah. people. Yeah. And, okay. and what makes it even worse politically, I guess, is that the Chinese started out much poorer than the Malays mm -hmm. and passed them over the years simply because they had more, they saved more, they worked harder, etc. So the Chinese were very re much resented uh, and in 1969 for a number of reasons there was this riot of Malays against the Chinese and in order to calm this down the government then put in a massive program of preferences for the Malays uh, in the universities and government uh, employment and so on. Who, who was in the government? Was that a, was the government dominated by Malays? The government has always been dominated by Malays. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but before, you see, in the university, for example, the uh, admission was just by qualifications. And so an absolute majority of the people in the universities were Chinese. I see. Uh, and and as, and as you went into the more difficult subjects like science and math, they were overwhelmingly Chinese. So that, for example, in the decade of the 1960s, the Chinese received 400 degrees in engineering. The Malays received four. Oh. So, so that's he, a little hard for the Malays to take. Yes, yes. And so the the, the government does what in 1969? They they start putting in preferences for the Malays in all these different programs, uh, and they set a goal that by 1990 the Malays will be represented equally and across the board in business and the universities, etc. And the result of these programs is one of the results has been that many of the Chinese have left Malaysia. Oh, I see. Uh, thousands of them, uh, because they have a tough time getting into the universities, uh, even though they have better qualifications. The Malay is all, the government also changed the language of the schools from English, which uh, to Malay, and the Chinese, of course, had learned to speak English, but they had not learned to speak Malay. So all of these things made life very difficult. Uh, they've also moved some of their capital out, so they've lost all that. Now, Malaysia was more fortunate than most countries, in that they had a great deal of economic growth during this period. Uh, they, they have oil, which was very good for them during the 70s especially. Uh, and so they became a modernized country. They went from being a predominantly agricultural country to being a predominantly commercial and industrial country. All of that softened the blow, as it were, mm -hmm. because there were now more engineers, more doctors, and so on, so that now you could have more Malay engineers and more Malay doctors without there being an absolute decline in the number of Chinese uh, doctors or Chinese en uh, engineers, right. Right? even though the proportions changed. Right, you know? right. So they escaped much of this. Uh, the, other, the other thing which is crucial uh, is that there is no free speech on ethnic uh, matters in Malaysia. That is, there are no Jesse Jacksons or Al Sharptons in Malaysia to keep things uh, uh, boiling. In fact, when I was there some years ago, uh, you know, I would get I would get very candid discussions when I'm behind closed doors in people's offices. But uh, the American Embassy arranged a dinner that evening for me, and most of those invited did not show because they dared not say anything in public, which would be a federal law. Oh, I see. In, crit in criticism of the program. Right. You're right. Let me quote you to yourself again. Uh, no more than 5% of Malays, quote, have been estimated to have actually benefited from these affirmative action yes. programs, and those people who were initially more fortunate were the most benefited, close quote. In other words, the pattern that we saw in India repeats itself Absolutely. in Malaysia.
the ones who are already near the top who mm -hmm. are this puts them over the top right they're capable of grabbing these jobs in or the yes. university positions yes all right but it's still a tiny percentage of the overall population right all right and you also write if there's any lesson from the history of affirmative action in Malaysia it is that extraordinary economic prosperity and growth, this tremendous mm -hmm. boom time they yeah. underwent, combined with extraordinary repression of free speech, yes. no Al Sharpton's around to cause trouble, yes. can make preferential programs viable. Mm -hmm. But to say that the country as a whole is better off would be to ignore many counterproductive consequences, mm -hmm. close quote. Uh, the counterproductive consequences are? The, loss, the flight of the Chinese, loss of them. To some extent, the Indians as well. Uh, loss of Chinese capital. Uh, the fact Malaysia itself, the government, uh, decided that just within the past few years that they simply were not getting as many engineers and high tech people that they need for the kind of economy they want. Mm -hmm. And so last year, they announced that they are going to go back to simply adm having admission by academic qualifications at the university. So this is one of the few cases where a program has apparently come to an end. Where they bump. Next case study, Affirmative Action and the Civil War in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, population about 19 million, roughly three quarters of the population Sinhalese, if I'm pronouncing that yes. correctly. Largest minority, the Tamils, represent about one-sixth of the population. I quote from Affirmative Action Around the World once again, since the middle of the 20th century, Sri Lanka has undergone a remarkable and catastrophic change in the relationship between its majority and minority populations. Explain. Well, in the, uh, as of the time that Sri Lanka became an independent nation at the, uh, near, near uh, on the late 40s, yes. people inside and outside of Sri Lanka were holding it up to the world as an example of harmony between majorities and minorities and saying, we can learn from Sri Lanka because it's so peaceful that people can get along together. There had, in the first half of the 20th century, there was not a single race riot between the Sinhalese and the Tamils. Uh, and there, there are many uh, evidences of the amity between the two groups. Do you have one, is this a case where one group is substantially more prosperous than oh, the yes. other? Yes, once again, the Tamils, who are the minority, are much more prosperous. And again, they're particularly good in uh, things like science and math. And there, there are historical reasons for this, that in colonial times, the British and the Americans sent missionaries to uh, Sri Lanka. So it was Ceylon, as it was called then. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the, the British colonial officials gave the British missionaries the more posh uh, assignments, and they sent the American missionaries up into the Jaffna Peninsula, which was a poorer area. But the Americans taught math and science more so than the British. And so ever since then, the Tamils have been much better at math and science than the Sinhalese. And at and one time, again, you found a wholly disproportionate number of the engineers, scientists, and people like that in uh, Sri Lanka were Tamils while the majority was lagging way behind. And again, this is, uh, this went along, this, this, this didn't disrupt No problem. No problem until they became an independent nation and until they began having elections. And one man, uh, Solomon Bondranike, uh, wanted to be prime minister, and so he pushed uh, identity politics. And the irony is that like so many people who push identity politics, he was not really part of this group that he was being uh, so strident about. Uh, Bondranike was, uh, uh, he was not a Buddhist, he was a Christian. He didn't speak a word of Sinhalese. His father was the British, his godfather was the British colonial governor. Uh, he studied either Oxford or Cambridge. But when he comes back, he now suddenly takes off Western clothes, puts on Buddhist robes, learns some words of Sinhalese, and now he becomes more Sinhalese than thou. And he pushes the idea that the Sinhalese ought to have all these preferences and quotas. Uh, and it's clear that the, uh, it was only to get, get himself elected. They were the majority after that, That's right. right. Uh, and, and once he got elected, he started. He, he lost interest in this stuff, and he's ready to work out some deal with the Tamils. But by this, he had worked people up so much with his identity stuff that now they turned on him and assassinated him. And since then, the, the subsequent leaders uh, got the message clearly, uh, and they began pushing uh, extremism toward the Tamils. And eventually things got so bad because, you see, the Tamils really had a poor area, so education was their only real uh, way up. Mm -hmm. And when they were shut out, uh, not totally, but shut out from, to a great extent from the universities, they were desperate, and uh, nothing would move the uh, government, and eventually there was civil war. Mm -hmm. And in that civil war, this little country lost more people dead than the United States lost during the entire Vietnam War. Mm -hmm.
Sri Lanka, quoting you, represents a tragic mockery of the underlying assumption of being able to control the course of events, an assumption implicit in affirmative action policies around the world, yes. close quote. That is to say, social engineers actually think they can engineer society. They, say it may, they, they think it may say it. Oh. They just can't do it. <laughs> now, but, Tom, isn't that an assumption implicit in virtually all government policy? You educate the population because you think the, the nation, whatever nation is in question, uh, will become more prosperous as a result. You build strong defenses because you think that's a way of preventing war. Oh, I mean, w what is distinctive about the affirmative assumption right. in affirmative action? I, I guess it's, it's the, the belief that you can sort of micromanage the results, and you can't. When you, when, you, when you educate the people, you don't say, now you go off there and become a chemist, and you go become uh, you know, a draftsman and so forth. You educate them, and then you turn them loose and let them sort themselves out. With affirmative action, you're prescribing actual end results, and that's mm -hmm. where you've gone beyond what you're capable of doing. I see. All right. Now we return home to affirmative action in America. I'm going to quote you yet again. The historical evolution of affirmative action in the United States would be difficult to understand without first realizing the first fact the legal obstacles which such policies must overcome in order to be acceptable in American courts of law as well as in the political arena. Legal obstacles such as? The 14th Amendment. Fairly, says, fairly substantial legal obstacles. That's right. Uh, uh, and, and politically you have to represent preferences and quotas as not being preferences and quotas. They're just being, uh, and you have to represent them as being temporary. The 14th Amendment says, or guarantees, equal treatment of all citizens. <laughs> But individual basis. It, that's right. It is implicitly opposed to group. Oh, that's right. Each, each, every citizen, not 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 every group of citizens or whatnot. And so you've got to overcome that. And so you've got to pretend that this is really just an anti-discrimination policy. Uh, and that, that pretense uh, gets pretty thin sometimes. The transparent dishonesty with which quotas and preferences have been instituted and maintained here in the United States, you write. Uh, is a dishonesty reaching into the highest court in the land, as the Weber case demonstrates. Take us through what took place in the Weber case. Uh, in the Weber case, was a, Weber was a uh, worker in a, in a, in a plant uh, in Louisiana, and he wanted to get into a training program, uh, which would qualify him for higher jobs. And he was uh, turned down, uh, and blacks who had lesser qualifications than him were admitted. And so he took this to the Supreme Court. And the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, says individuals and uh, Justice Brennan, someone with a great uh, verbal uh, sleight of hand, uh, turned this around and said, well, but, we, but the real intent of Congress, you see, was this or that. And so he then ruled against Weber. And then when the dissenting opinion of Rehnquist said, it said that this, this reminded him of the great escapes of Houdini, that the, you know, the language was so plain and clear in the law itself, and it was also plain and clear if you got, got into the legislative history where they talked about the possibility of quotas. And uh, Hubert Humphrey, who was pushing the Civil Rights Act, said, you know, I'll eat my hat if this, if this thing turns out the quote in, in the quotas. Well, he wasn't there to eat his hat. It wasn't just Brennan who would have done it. The whole court since, and the court, yes. the court has upheld this, this kind of doctrine since, because without it, affirmative action programs simply cannot stand. That's right. All right. Affirmative action targeted in the United States originally at African Americans mm -hmm. who suffer the obvious historical yes. disadvantage of, of centuries of slavery. You write, however, that affirmative actions have mute programs and policies have mutated such that they now cover minority groups and women, quote, so that such policies now apply to a substantial majority yes. of the American population, close quote. How did that happen? Oh, as, as, as in India and other countries, that once the goodies out there, politicians at every, every election have a, have a tendency to want to hand those goodies out to more and more people to get more and more votes. And similarly in India, that the, that the vast majority of people who are entitled to preferences now uh, greatly outnumber the untouchables. And then the ones who are able to use them greatly outnumber them even more so. So, uh, so that you, you, you completely get away from the rationale. I think one of the more striking cases to me was uh, in San Francisco where in this elite high school, uh, white students are admitted with lower scores than Chinese American students. Now, it's hard to see how, how the treatment of blacks really justifies any of that. Affirmative action for yeah. whites. Yeah, that's right. But, but the, 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 once you've set it in motion, this is where, again, you see you can't control the course of events the way you imagine. And so you end up uh, with this kind of anomaly, which has nothing to do with the original rationale. Quote again, benefits to black millionaires 
are far more, far more demonstrable than benefits to blacks in poverty, close quote. Yes. Explain oh, that one. Oh, black millionaires can have, have, have an advantage over white millionaires when it comes to buying radio station licenses. Now, the, 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 the kid living in poverty in Harlem or Watts uh, is not likely to be uh, up for a radio, to radio station license. Uh, you know, and similarly with medical school benefits and so forth. All of that is for people who already have a certain amount, and this puts them over the top. It enables the sons of black doctors to go to Harvard, you know, uh, more easily than the sons of white doctors. Okay. Now, Tom, the argument would be black Americans do suffer from the historical facts of yes. slavery. So affirmative action is a reasonable thing. It's simply gotten out of hand or been mis been permitted to be corrupted, right? What's wrong well, with that argument? Well, but if you confine yourself to the United States, or you, you, that may sound plausible, which is the very reason I did a worldwide study, uh, because exactly the same thing has happened in every country in which it's been tried. Uh, the classic case was Pakistan, where the uh, affirmative action was put in for people in East Pakistan who were way behind the people in West Pakistan. Fine. But again, as time goes on, this, this, these, these goodies get handed out to more and more people. And the irony in that case is that East Pakistan seceded and became the independent nation of Bangladesh, and the program keeps going right on because there are another, enough other constituencies. So when this happens again and again and again, you can't say this is just an aberration that something that went wrong. It always goes wrong. Uh, all right. Let's look at the common patterns that affirmative action programs around the world seem to share. Pattern one, virtually everywhere you argue, uh, argue, affirmative action programs are intended as temporary measures, yes. but become permanent. Yes. Why is that? Again, politically, uh, it's hard to say no, and it's easy to say yes if you're in politics, because you're spending somebody else's money. You'll be blamed for saying no. You will not be blamed for saying yes, and it won't cost you a dime. And so you keep expanding these things outward, onward and outward. Uh, in the United States, for example, some have argued that white women have benefited more than blacks from affirmative action. Uh, and part of the reason is that there are more white women with the, with the complementary resources like high college education and so forth. And what that means is that in some cases, blacks may be worse off in the sense that a given job that a black man may be better qualified to do, let's say, mm -hmm. will not, may not go to him because uh, you've now made college uh, a requirement for the job. Uh, and it goes to someone else who's more likely to have gone to college. Mm -hmm. Pattern two, affirmative action programs tend to exacerbate rather than ameliorate tensions among different groups. Yes. That's not just the case in India, but you argue that that tends to be the case wherever affirmative yes. action is instituted. Yes. The classic example is Baki. Uh, neither Baki nor the... Baki Supreme Court case. Yes. Neither Alan Baki nor the people on the other side were able to show that he would or would not have been admitted to the university had there been no affirmative action. Uh, and so we don't know that Baki lost anything. But Baki himself was sufficiently aggrieved that he took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. and, and he was then admitted, which he might not have been admitted had there been no affirmative action for blacks. And there are lots and lots of Alan Bakis. Yes. And in a situation where political correctness would su suggest that you don't complain in public, mm -hmm. this forces the grievance yes, out of the political discourse underground. That's right. This is the, the pattern that uh, you identify, you return to this again and again. Even where affirmative action programs have been in place for decades, almost nobody ever examines the actual results. That's right. I, how come? There's no political payoff to, for looking at the facts. And what, what do you, you're, you're, you're a politician. What do you gain by looking at the facts? You don't know what the facts are going to turn out to be. Are you going to bet your career on how the facts are going to turn out? Right now, for example, since they've uh, eliminated uh, affirmative action at the University of California system, uh, there are, I have been trying to get data on what, what about the graduation rate of black students now. At least one region of the university has tried to get that data. Now, the data UC not, system eliminated affirmative action, what was that, about four years ago, Tom? Yeah, something like that. Okay, fine, go ahead. And so, so, in other words, there's time for results to have come in. That's right. And people like myself have been saying for years that if you allow blacks to redistribute themselves within the system, each one going to the university that, for which he's normally qualified, you're going to have a higher graduation rate. And graduation is what it's about. It's not about being on campus so the administration can gush about diversity. It's so these guys can get an education and go out in the world and get the advantage of that. That data is not available. Nobody can pry it loose. The same thing is true in the University of Texas system. I mean, imagine you're... These the, are public institutions. That's right. But imagine you're head of the, the University of Texas. You don't need data coming out saying, my God, now that you got rid of affirmative action, black uh, graduation rates have shot up. 
you go thin and then again, you've been saying all along that this is a wonderful thing for blacks. You've got too much invested to, to take that kind of risk. What do you do about it, Tom? You stop it. You stop it. Uh, and you're gonna, and only stopping it will work. Uh, this notion that a few years ago, you know, you could mend it, not end it, and so forth. You can't. You reject that out of hand. Uh, uh, absolutely, you know, because there has been so many undercover ways of doing these things that have already been used. It's clear that people, and it's not just here in India, everywhere. Uh, that as long as you allow people wiggle room, they're going to wiggle. All right. Final question. The recent Supreme, case, uh, Supreme Court case on affirmative action programs at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor writes, quote, We expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. Close quote. They expected that 25 years ago. And they will probably be expecting that 25 years from now. Thomas Sowell, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.